good start, if we may. Uh, so we should make a start. So it's going up to ATM. As you know, the rules of the game are that we um, drop to probably half an hour presentation, followed by questions and answer session, and we'll finish uh, pretty promptly at uh, 9 a.m. So many of you are familiar uh, uh, here today. Uh, welcome again, and uh, newcomers, welcome also. Our uh, business research series is about the practical application of research. We want the research of our world-class faculty here at Olin to be applicable, to be available to the, the business community. And by coming together, joining research and practice in forums like this, uh, we hope to, to improve business and also get some feedback on the research that we're doing within the business school. As part of that uh, general initiative, part of that, that, that drive in the business school, we have uh, faculty submitting papers to the, the Olin Award, which is reviewed, reviewed by a, a panel of highly, uh, highly uh, distinguished judges from all sectors of the corporate community, with an eye to seeing how research can be applicable in, uh, in business. And the best research in terms of that applicability is chosen to be featured at these uh, business research series presentations. And Dick Mahoney, who is here today, is our uh, distinguished executive in residence and former CEO of Monsanto. And uh, Olin has benefited tremendously uh, from uh, Dick's vision and from his, uh, his gifts and generosity over the years. And he's made programs like these possible and continue to challenge Olin and our faculty to, to think about the practical application of research, to find new ways to put our world-class uh, cutting-edge research into the hands of business leaders who might benefit from it. And business research series is a direct outcome of that challenge and of that, uh, that support that uh, Dick has, uh, has kindly and uh, strongly given to the school over the years and continues to do so. So thank you, Dick. Um, I think the quality, something I, coming here as Dean just over a year now, um, have found it really inspiring is, is the, the quality of our faculty, not only in terms of their sheer intellectual capital, but also the impact that their applied research has on real world business issues. And as we develop a new strategic plan over the last year or so, we developed a, a strong mission and vision for the school. And the vision is to produce uh, world class or world changing uh, business education, research, and impact with those three interlinks education, research, and impact. Um, and I think some of the, uh, some of the research that will be presented here today and in this series more generally uh, will illustrate how we're going about <coughs> doing that. Well, our research presenter today probably needs no introduction, but I'll, uh, I'll say a few words anyway. It was my esteemed predecessor, uh, Dr. Mahendra Gupta, who served as Dean of the Olin Business School for 11 years and has served on the faculty since 1980. Oh, sorry, 1990. Uh, in 2004, he was named the Geraldine J. and Robert L. Virgil Professor of Accounting and Management. Bob Virgil, of course, being another previous dean of Stephen Dean as well. Um, students, our students have given Mahendra the Reed Teaching Award no less than eight times since 2001. Uh, Mahendra earned a master's degree in industrial administration from Carnegie Mellon University and a doctorate in accounting from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. But we won't hold that again. His research interests include managerial accounting and strategic cost management and control. His research presentation today explains how firms employing a triumvirate of tactics, decision rights, performance measurements and incentives can outperform firms that focus on only one or two of these tactics. So, Andrew, the floor is yours. And I wanted to start uh, uh, paying some homage to that uh, uh, 
it was uh, uh, it was during my time uh, in the dean's office, and and they constantly challenged us as a faculty collectively of the business school uh, to to uh, to see that whether our research is led by the business people and has the relevance for the business people. Uh, can they really act on it? And so I thought that I will start today that when I stepped out of my role and I got into the research part, uh, Dick, I carried your message. And I wanted to do the first research that at least in my opinion has uh, that potential. And, and that's where uh, this old quote, it is not, uh, it's not new, it has been going in the literature for a long time. But uh, uh, if organization researchers are to make finding more relevant to practitioners, they must focus their effort on organization performance. At the end of the day, we all, we all pay attention to the performance. Whatever way you want to measure that performance, that becomes the key driver on how we are going to design organizational policies, how we are going to design our business strategies, or how we are going to choose the businesses to be in. Uh, we, can never, we can never forget this important fact that the businesses are driven by performance, and thereby the factors that help us understand those drivers of performance are, are critical uh, for success of the business and also critical for the management. But the second part is also equally important. It's applied only to the extent that the variable it deals with can be manipulated in practice. That research at the end of the day gives something tangible that business community feel empowered to be able to change, manipulate, and adopt within their own context and thereby see the potential impact on, on that performance. And that leads to what I'm planning to present today is, uh, uh, is this organization architecture and effect of organization architecture on uh, the performance. The overall theory of organization architecture, that is, I'm not taking any credit. I'm not developing a new theory. And in many ways, that I'm not developing a concept uh, here that is new. You have known these things for a very long time, each and every one of you, whether you are in academia or in the business. That uh, there are important factors that drive behavior of individuals. And there are three factors that I focus on in this, based on the old theory. Are decision right? To what extent we empower or delegate decision authorities to individuals? Sounds very simple. But later on, I'm going to discuss more about it, that uh, we create a perception of delegation, but we actually do not delegate the decision rights. Once you delegate decision right, how do you put the performance matrix in place? You have delegated responsibility for making a decision. How are you going to evaluate the goodness of those decisions in terms of the impact, and how the individual who is going to be measured against the performance measurement and is given the decision rights, feel incentivized. Because if that individual does not feel incentivized, none of those two other things are going to make that big a difference. And these are the three factors that come together. So the theory basically says that the design of reward system must consider the decision rights delegated to the employees and information captured through the performance measurement system. Similarly, the design of measurement system depends on the allocation of decision right. These three factors, as the theory talks about, are the three legs of a stool. They work together. You remove a leg, or you have an imbalance across those legs. And you are going to have an organization structure that is not going to be efficient and it is likely to affect the performance. So that's a background. Where we come here from is trying to test that. So far in the, uh, in the practice or in academia, we have not been able to test this very simple basic proposition of how these three factors come together because of the data. 
as Dick always talked about, bringing this kind of a forum together where uh, we put our researchers in front of the business community, that there is, uh, there is a potential for business community and academic community work together. Because in academia, we're always looking for the data we can use to test uh, the models and the theories that we talk about uh, in our research in the classroom. So very simple. Keep the picture in mind that uh, and the three legs. Our study and contribution, we are trying to empirically establish how these three legs interact with each other and how basically under emphasis on any of the legs can have a significant impact on the performance of the organization. So that leads to the data. And we have been very fortunate to get the data. It's a survey-based data based on a very important technology, but very simple technology that is available in the marketplace. And that technology allows us to compare how these three legs are operating within that particular context across different firms that use that technology. So the survey research, uh, it is about the, uh, the a tool uh, which is commercial cards that are used by uh, companies all over, both for profit company, not for profit government, and other things. Uh, it is uh, it is a unique proprietary database and allows us to look at the cross from cross section sample of uh, organization. Just to expand on the research setting, it's over a trillion dollar market. That, uh, that we are looking at. In this particular research, we are just looking at one segment of that market, which is a purchasing card, a pro card. By the way, any one of you here have a PP card or pro card in your business? Yes, yeah. So, so many, of, many of you have, they come under different names and terms, and, uh, and this, was, uh, this was a technology that was introduced in late 80s in the government sector in order to create a more efficient government. Early 90s, it started uh, getting adopted in the business sectors also. And it has really taken off over, uh, over the past uh, uh, 30 or so years. Uh, the growth of this technology year over year is significantly faster than the GDP growth. Uh, even though this technology is essentially captured <coughs> It is not creating new transactions, but capturing the transactions. And uh, it turns it words. So using the technology, it makes the procure-to-payment cycle far more efficient, far more effective, reduces the risk, improves the visibility, and overall cost of procure-to-pay process. If you look at just a, a footnote there, that US federal government alone in 2015, put nearly $20 billion of its procurement transactions on the P cards, and resulting in the saving of close to 10% on the total transaction value. And that's, uh, that's where this technology, it's a very simple technology, because we all have the card. So you have the card, and, and you have authority to purchase, and you pay at the end of the end of the period. It's the same way corporations use this technology. Please feel free to ask me a question if uh, any of the details are uh, are not clear, or, or you want to, uh, to know more about it. So the data that we use uh, in our research. Uh, in order for a company, a corporation, an organization to use this technology, the cards are issued by the banks. Cards are, are they fall under the brands, the three major brands, MasterCard, Visa, and American Express. It is uh, MasterCard and Visa cards are issued by the banks. Banks require company to have a purchase card administrator somebody who is going to carry an overall responsibility to manage the program within the organization. And that is our unit of analysis. What we are looking in this research is surveying those purchase card administrators 
and looking at to what extent those administrators are given the decision right to take the best advantage of the technology that has been put in front of them, does the company has the necessary performance matrix for those purchase card administrators, and do they provide the proper incentive for those administrators? These administrators are not the people who themselves go and use the card to make all the purchases. These administrators are the ones who provide the oversight of the distribution of this tool within the organization and work very closely with the CFO and the treasury uh, functions of the business. So we sent this survey, uh, the, basically the agency sent it out to over 4,000 people, uh, purchase card administrators. All major banks, all top banks are represented in this survey poll, and almost every industry is represented in this survey poll. Uh, out of 1,200 plus responses, about 586 were complete for the, with the data that we needed in order to do our analysis. So, going jumping right into it, how do we evaluate uh, the decision rights? Uh, we, uh, we asked uh, in this, I'm using the word we, but it's a survey asked uh, uh, the questions, the seven different questions about uh, the different kind of decision rights, whether or not uh, the card administrator has, and if the right is there, whether the administrator has any influence. So we wanted to check not only if a certain right is assigned, but whether the right is assigned with enough emphasis or it is just simply another activity that is assigned but has no teeth attached to it. So managing activity, establishing policies, procedure, training, managing format, content, communicating about the programs and policies, overall influence on the card program. Performance measurement, the second, uh, second leg. We look at the performance measurement that, first of all, is there a performance measurement system in place? And then if there is a performance measurement system, the survey lists six different criteria of the performance measurement, whether the transactions are captured, the cardholders are satisfied, whether uh, you are you're getting the right dollar amounts on the card program, uh, so overall effectiveness of the card program. Is the card program working effectively within the organization or not? So first, the respondent takes the performance measure, and then the respondent says that, yes, I have the metric, whether the metric is emphasized or not in the organization. So that's how we are looking at the performance measure. And then you have our organization architecture. This was something very, very interesting. Most often, when it comes to incentive, we put incentive plan in place, and we do not pay enough attention to how the person who is subject to incentive plan appreciate it or not. So one thing we discovered, talking with the P-card administrators and in this industry, that often administrators at many organizations saw their job as a dead-end job. <laughs> if I do it well, that's what I'm going to continue to do. And I'm going to become a career administrator. Now, somebody may say that what's wrong with it? Well, if you, want, if you have aspiration to move up in the organization, you do not want to see yourself caught in a dead-end job. So, uh, so it is about whether they have a job security, promotions, pays, and bonuses. Do they really have incentives that matters? <clears throat> and then uh, the last part is the performance basis. Because I said the objective of this program this tool and technology is to capture the procure to pay transaction. Where this technology is most efficient is low dollar transaction. <coughs> so 
So essentially, that's why the first highlighted column is percentage of under $2,500 that I capture to the top program. On an average, the survey data shows that on an average, the average transaction amount that falls under the low transaction is less than $500. And on an average, 90% of the non-payroll transaction in most organizations, they are of $500 or in that category, or at under $2,500. On an average, the PCAR tool saves about $70 per transaction in pure transaction process from the purchasing to the payment cycle. So if you take the on an average $500 to make it simple, and you're saving a $70 on just the transaction processing cost, you can start counting the dollars very quickly that how in organization sometime inefficiencies do exist that do not rise up sufficiently to the level of observation of people in charge and we continue to promote the same kind of inefficient behavior. So on top of it, it's a competitive environment. As I said, that we, uh, we asked uh, 10 major issuers. The so banks provide additional incentives. Essentially, it's a cashback incentive. We had to say that the organization, if you capture more of your spending on the car, we are going to give you, based on the level of spending, the numbers could be anywhere from half percent to one and a half percent. The average in the industry is slightly north of one percent. So you get, you save first on the transaction cost, you save second on the incentives that you are going to get and then overall transparency of the data that becomes very visible, and thereby reducing the fraud and misuse of the information. So the performance measure we wanted to capture is why the tool is put in place, and is the tool actually delivery. So to what extent low dollar transaction amounts are captured, we also look at the second level, 2,500 to 10,000, transaction amount. We don't expect the, the effect to be that huge, but, uh, but under the low dollar, we do certainly are hoping that we are able to find effect. And we create essentially the research design is uh, fairly straightforward. So the triple high is you got three legs in place, and three legs are rightfully emphasized. Now I'm going to use certain words that are fairly loose, rightfully emphasized. There is, we are not doing here a theoretical analysis for each form that what will be the optimal length of the leg or the emphasis of each of those three legs. So we are making an assumption that if they have a certain tool or certain uh, architecture in place, are they putting an emphasis or, on it or not? But since we do not have a theory to guide us, that what is the right size of the leg within that individual organization on an empirical setting. We divide the world into, for each of the variable, performance measure, decision right, or incentives. We essentially rank order information or responses, and we divide it as a median. Those who fall above median, we call them with a high emphasis. Those who fall below median, we call them low emphasis. So it's a very simplistic extension of the concept of having a tree leg and trying to find the right balance and emphasis on the tree legs. So the triple high, the one that is highlighted yellow, triple high essentially says that the tree legs are in place and tree legs are conceptually balanced and at the right emphasis. Double high, which is the next uh, and, and turquoise, uh, one of the leg is missing. And the third one, very light blue, is you have just one leg. You have two of the legs missing. And triple low 
is the base case where either you do not have any of it or you really do not have any balance across. So we are trying to use this design to test whether the existence of three legs with high emphasis translate into a stronger performance for the organization. So basically, going back to our school, you got three legs, the right is two, that is perfectly balanced and good to sit on, compared to one leg is missing, or legs are broken. And later on, I'll come back and I'll say that even though graphically and intuitively you say, it does not make any sense. Why would somebody have a stool with a leg missing or uneven legs? <laughs> but, uh, but you are, uh, I'm going to tell you a few of the examples that uh, we live in that world constantly, always. So to start with, this is one thing that uh, uh, Dick Mahoney uh, taught me again and again uh, during this business research workshop. First of all, uh, I cannot use the words that I'm going to put in the paper. And secondly, come to the point as quickly as you can. <laughs> so this is come to the point. Essentially, the first, uh, the top part, uh, uh, part of the table uh, basically presents the percentage of under 2,500 transaction capture on the P card. And we see here that uh, for the triple high, 52% of those transactions are captured compared to any other configuration. Any other configuration, whether with a leg missing, two legs missing, or whether there is not enough emphasis on any or all of the legs. 52%, so just to, based on purely simple, without any control and without getting very scientific about it, the purely univariate structure, we do find that a typical high is outperforming other design structure. Now, interestingly, if you note that only 69 of the 500 plus organizations in the sample had triple high. So, uh, so that's uh, that's an important part. That, that was our surprise initially, uh, as uh, in fact 140 fell into triple low. That means the technology in place, but uh, not with enough decision rights or incentive systems or performance measurement. We were surprised to find that even under 25 to 10,000, the triple high category had 32% of the transactions captured compared to any other configuration. Now, I cannot stand here uh, uh, presenting an academic paper and stop here, so I need to not throw in uh, a little bit uh, a little bit more technology. And, <laughs> and, and, and that gets, uh, sorry, Dick, but I'd like to put an equation in front. But you haven't used the word uh... Exogenous or endogenous yet? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not used that, and, and exactly. And, 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 and my Latin is really bad, so I'm not going to use those letters or words either. Uh, but, uh, but so we put that in, uh, in a regression format, essentially to control for many of the other factors that might be influencing the outcome that we just saw. So we look at the control in terms of distribution of card, spending limits, the program age, number of suppliers accepting the card, uh, the total size of the respondent, uh, type of the respondent, a lot of the control that we put in place. And we try to essentially look, the middle one, that group, group is where we have got those eight different categories that if we do, whether the group with the triple high stands out compared to the other groups. So no, I, I now I see that there are several of you who have been in my class and an alum of this program. So I can I can certainly at least challenge you that you remember your statistics. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, what we see here is uh, the very first line on the top, triple high. Again, we find in both of those performance metric categories. Triple high, in fact, is the prominent and consistent, significant effect that, uh, that we observe.
observe. In fact, uh, we do not observe except in two t situations so with high decision right and high rewards and decision right. None of those are even significant statistically. That means that uh, when the organization architecture does not present itself in a balanced perspective, in fact, the other factors often <coughs> do not Can you explain that performance measure? <coughs> Yes, so performance measure is the first, uh, uh, the one that uh, starts with 18.81, that is under 2,500 transaction captured on the purchase card. And uh, the second performance measure is uh, 2,500 to 10,000 transaction captured on the purchase card. And the significance of the uh, 18 is what? So after controlling for the firms with no legs, one or two legs, and all the control variables. So after controlling for all other factors that we use within our design, does the triple high fat still have a significant impact? And that's, uh, that's what we are, we are looking at. That, that the impact, what we saw here, 52% and 32%, is it purely a statistical artifact? Is it not really mm -hmm. driven by that treatment, but for the confounding variables or correlated variables? What is it measuring? What is the measurement? What is it measuring? What is the performance measuring? It is measuring the under 20. So if take, for example, an organization has a million dollar of transactions that fall under $2,500 <coughs> or less, it is measuring of that million dollar of transaction, what percentage of transactions are captured on this tool and technology. Because the tool is never going to work unless you use the technology. And only when you use the technology, you are going to be able to capture the savings that you are going to get by increasing the efficiency of the process. So we again find, uh, we find the significance uh, on, on that, and, uh, and which allows us to essentially first conclude the validation, empirical validation of the theory. And, and then in a way, as I said earlier, that the theory by itself is not a new innovation. This is not something that we are trying to claim uh, that we are bringing it to the market. Uh, but what we are is that it's the very first time an empirical validation of this construct has been able to quantify and, and present it. And so the, our analysis finds that delegate the organization that delegate greater decision rights to PCAR administrators, again, as measured by one of those seven factors, place greater emphasis on the car program management. You put a tool out, mm -hmm. what do you want from it, and how you are going to measure what you are looking for. And the third is substantially connect card program administrator rewards to program performance metrics. Organizations that are going to put emphasis on all three of them, they report significantly higher program performance. That is, that they are reporting they're able to capture the transactions, and they are going to capture the saving, the economic benefit, and the risk benefit associated with those transactions. Yes, sir? Does that imply that there might be a fourth leg that would take that 18 to 80, or, get, I mean, some way to get 18 higher? So the 18's good compared to all the others, but it seems like, still seems low. Yes, so, uh, so as, uh, as we always, you're absolutely right that uh, we, we put a caveat in any of these research uh, that there are always additional correlated factors that this research is not catching. So in, in a way that uh, one can think about, to take for example, uh, often people have talked about the culture as a fourth leg. That, uh, that decision rights uh, and performance measures and incentives, uh, you need to have the culture. Then there are other set of researchers who, are, who argue that these three legs, in fact, are 
the one that defines the culture. So it's a, it's a part of it that, that uh, yes, we can talk in terms of uh, another fourth leg or fifth leg, or we can also talk in terms of uh, the other control variables that are not included in this. We can also talk about, can you extend this beyond a, a different transaction amount or in a different, uh, different places? And, and we are, uh, in fact, that's one of the things that we are going to be doing as, uh, as we move forward and we see the technology moving forward. So, principal takeaway is that organizations that benefit from, again, repeating myself, Concurrent structuring of incentive, performance measurement, and delegation of authority to business units. Often organizations lack one or more. More attention often is paid on something that seems much simpler, creating performance metrics. Less attention is paid making those performance metrics matter or combining the right decision rights, or paper document, that uh, the greater focus on per employee performance measurement, absent a decision delegation of authority, adequate structure, may yield disappointing results. And the part that we do not talk about it here is often organizations do not even know that they are getting disappointing results. Because somehow, they either do not have the benchmark or they have never been in the time when they know their organization can perform significantly better by putting the right structure in place. So I was telling you that other applications. One of the applications is family business. One of the big challenges in a family business is having these three legs in place, delegation of rights. Often we have a delegation of right in perception, not in reality. So you have all the, all the places tick marked, but not enough emphasis, not enough honor, not enough emphasis based on how you're going to evaluate a family business member. What will the performance matrix that are going to put in place and whether you're going to stick to them. Take, for example, healthcare. Healthcare, we have the biggest problem in the healthcare or healthcare cost is, is misalignment between who makes the decision rights to incur all the expenses, who is evaluating whose performance, and where the incentives lie. It's one of the, one of the big pet peeves I have completely moving away from this topic, that our healthcare industry is health correction industry. In fact, it thrives on us getting sick, mm -hmm. not us keeping healthy. Take, for example, education. We are sitting in a higher education. In fact, a huge part of decision right is delegated to people like us, the faculty members. <coughs> we are the one who design the course, what needs to be taught, how many sections, how many students are going to be. And most often, we have absolutely no incentive how what we do is going to have connect with the value that a student is going to get from the course, from the program, and be able to capture post her graduation. It's a major expense, whether you are going to go to the elementary school or you are going to go to the Institute of Higher Learning. New technologies, we put new technologies. I'm old enough to say that I, I saw that in the SAP and ERP. I always used to have this challenge with and the discussion with the CEOs. They would say, oh, we are putting hundreds and millions of dollars in the new information technology. And the first question I used to ask that the people who are supposed <coughs> to know it, do they really know how to use it? And do they have any say in it? And you often find that there's, you spend a lot of money in buying and putting the technology rather than preparing the organization with respect to the right decision rights, right performance metrics, how you're supposed to use it, 
and incentives. In fact, we find within our survey data, and, uh, and that, was, uh, that was quite a surprise. Uh, not surprise in terms of most often we'll think 80-20 uh, uh, rule. 80% of the overall, as I put down that $1 trillion plus spending, it is captured by less than 20% of the companies or organizations. In fact, uh, you can cut across some of the large Fortune 500 companies also, and they are woefully underperformed. Because again, not having the structure of the organization in the place and not really giving the right, uh, uh, right system. Department of Defense in the last few years uh, have pulled back their capture of the spending on this tool by nearly 30% because of a couple of stories that came out in the newspaper with respect to the abuse of the card program. And in the process, Department of Defense on an yearly basis is losing the potential saving of close to half a billion dollars. How do we react to this when you have this structure in place? Yes, sir. And going back to the, the stool analogy, it's an example where you're talking about, let's say my company has a policy where I've got a purchase card, but I can only spend $250, whereas the, let's say the average capture is 500. So is, is the gap between my ability to spend 250 and 500 related to that other stool of the performance metric where I could find the value? Yes, you can, you can start looking at whether the control like is spending limit. So what you just gave an example is that you give a technology or tool, you give a decision right, and then you take it away. Yeah, right. So it has got two effects. First, you're putting a limit. You cannot do anything more than 250. But it also has implicitly a communication and a message. I do not trust you to use the technology for more than $250. Before that, you need to come back and go through the same approval process that, uh, uh, that you, are, uh, you are going to have. Uh, I, it's, uh, I, I share a personal example, not related to 250, but something very similar. Last year, I was visiting a university, and, uh, and I, was, I was in the provost office, uh, uh, and the provost was very proudly explaining it to me that how he approves $10,000 expense uh, submitted by the schools uh, with respect to whether they can find, buy the stationery or they can, they can spend it on any activity. And I, I was completely shocked. I was shocked that uh, that's organization, that delegation of decision right, is only on its face. There is, there is no decision right delegation. If somebody has to constantly get their action approved, that organization is going to constantly be looking up to some other place to find solutions. And nobody is going to take the risk to make the decisions that they may need to make on the ground. I'm going to open it for the questions. It's already started, so uh, yes. So my experience working as a consultant, and I see exactly in over my career how these three legs work together. Mm -hmm. My experience is that companies cut their employees on the decision rights almost to zero they misalign the reward, but they hold it to a high level of performance. So what happens is the, the people are risk averse. They're basically in C, they basically live in CYA mode. And so the company isn't getting the performance that they want because they don't trust their employees and they're not willing to put the, the compensation plan in place. So that's been, that's been my experience. How does that tie up with the data that you found? This, this, is, this is basically the, the point that I'm saying that to take away. Performance measures, you're absolutely right. In my work, I find it very frustrating. You talk about performance measures, and somebody in HR is start going to pull out the books where the performance measures are written in great details. And we are going to fill out the questionnaire at the end of the year. 
where how we are going to have self-assessment and then you are going to have supervisory assessment, we are going to come up with a category and at the end of the day we are going to go and tell the employee, by the way, the salary increase pool is 2% this year and almost all of you are going to get that. <laughs> We, we do not have the incentive structure that really has the bite. So we spend a lot of time because that's easy. To put the matrix in place, to put something, to create more paperwork, that's easy. <coughs> to really take the next step in action, which is really going to motivate individual. And the decision right. We give the decision right, but we chip it away. Every path of the way. And when you do that, you create a culture in the organization of mistrust. Yeah. And, uh, and people are people are not going to, not going to <clears throat> this is where I started with uh, something that 90% of our economy depends on family businesses and small businesses. You see it all the time, this issue about misalignment of uh, the three factors or in a startup community. My son lives in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, so he, he kind of, uh, on a daily basis, just talks about uh, that community. And when he saw this research, he said, Dad, you should come and give a talk here, because most of us uh, here are struggling with these issues. And, uh, uh, and they are, again, putting a technology, putting a tool out, simple. Making the tools, technology, the programs work in the organization far more complex. As soon as we bring individuals, human element in play, the theory says that you've got to have a balance in perspective. You've got to have, put the trust to the decision rights. You've got to put performance matrix. What do you want people to do? And at the end of the day, you must have the incentives in place. Other questions? Other examples? I love to have examples. And one of my colleagues, I hope he's not going to give me now the trouble. <laughs> uh, Andrew Knight, he is one of the winners of the business series and presented here before. Andrew? Uh, I'm curious, I saw that one of your variables as a control was program age. And so I'm just curious if you observe, uh, are organizations getting better at this? Uh, does it seem over uh, the length of a program, or are some just better at the outset of implementing this program from the start? So, we did not check the second one, that, uh, but we did not find age as uh, a significant. We went into it exactly the same thing, Andrew, that uh, maybe there is a reach to the equilibrium that over time organizations are going to understand that uh, and, and then put the, the right processes in place. We could not find that age really made a difference. Uh, and we could not also find that there was a consistent pattern with the age. Uh, I'll give an example, and uh, you're not recording this, right? Actually, yes, it's going on. It's going on webinar. OK, I'm going to cross that example. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Question. Um, are there any survey questions in relation to uh, PCA getting support from senior management for the the yes. Yes. So we had top management support, okay. and and we did not. Uh, uh, Mr. the survey as a top management support as an important question, uh, and we did not use it. Uh, uh, I do not know the reason actually why, because in some ways one could call it that one of the important incentive is having your top management support. Gotcha. And I, even from the top management as far as you know letting the rest of the employees know as far as the program and making sure that they embrace it. The rest of the employees get to know it very quickly when you start taking the decision rights chipped away. So as, uh, uh, as earlier uh, question was asked that, okay, you put the program and say you cannot spend more than $250 per transaction, that information becomes known very quickly in the organization. And, uh, and once it becomes quickly, then people take more safety path, I'm just going to get approved rather than spend the money. Yes, sir. I've got a question. With the, with the survey results in, uh, affected by the, the, the average tenure of the teams being measured, so if you've got a longer tenure team incenting 
first becomes more difficult. So, just so this is to some extent uh, mm -hmm. goes back to what Andrew was uh, uh, saying, the age of the program, how long the program has been in place. I'll talk more about that. Yes, yeah, so I'm coming to that. Uh, yeah, so the coming to that, that the purchase card administrators and the team of the purchase card administrators, so we do not have the information on the tenure of the team. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that in some companies, they are there for a long time. Some companies, they rotate in and out because they get tired and leave the job and go to some other place. Uh, but we do not, uh, in some ways, uh, it's a good question. We don't have information. We are not sure where it is going to go because those administrators are very dependent on the senior authorities in the organization right. to set the tone of uh, uh, how these three legs are going. So these three legs are, in fact, given to them rather than they build those three legs. Yes. First to comment, during the financial crisis, the stock analyst said Jamie Dimon was a pleasure to listen to because he understood the formulas and therefore understood the derivative uh, positions of J.P. Morgan uh, and had run the bank accordingly. So it isn't all that to know the, the formulas. Um, secondly, my question is in terms of performance, have they done multi-year performance measures? In other words, not just how did you do this year, but how have you done over two, three, four years? And then tie that into whether you could rotate to other assignments. Yeah, so we have, uh, so first of all, uh, I, I don't mean to imply that uh, Jimmy Diamond's formulas do not work. <laughs> uh, in fact, this research has very little to do with, uh, with that, uh, that particular strategy. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, a major challenge in the survey research is to get the longitudinal data, uh, because that almost calls for the same organization answering the survey in the same way, year after year, or, or every frequency. And whether the same teams of the individuals are going to be answering. So we do not have longitudinal data on the same organization. The survey data does has a cross-sectional data. So at any given point of time, cross-section of companies or organization, and, and we do not find that uh, results are much different, uh, no matter which part of the history that we pick. Look at um, the uh, you know the there, there's a school of thought in purchasing where it's like no PO no pay where you want to put everything on a purchase order so you're negotiating good savings and good rates up front as opposed to putting things on P cards and and that that sometimes looking at rebates and just P card from a savings standpoint could be a little misleading because you're you know you're getting a little rebate from a bank for putting this card on there, but you're missing out on savings because ultimately you're, somebody's paying that 2% because you're introducing an intermediary in the form of a bank. Yeah. So first of all, uh, most often when you're going to have a small dollar transactions, mm -hmm. that negotiation that you're talking about, they yes. apply very well into large inventory construction, capital transaction, but not small dollar transaction. Second, that uh, we do not use it uh, in the study, but the survey also finds that uh, it increases the discount received from supplier by using this tool, because the tool now has the capability to consolidate all the purchases, either by the category or supplier, and that gives the buyer the leverage to go to an individual supplier and say, I may be able to shift the purchasing effort to you, or I'm buying so much from you, even though it is purchased in uh, in, in very uh, uh, very distributed way, but I'm still buying so much from you, and I deserve a discount. Otherwise, I'm going to quit. So, in fact, it increases the negotiation power rather than less because of the visibility of uh, uh, of the purchases that are made compared to again compared to the old system that you talked about. Yeah. And conceptually, you could get that from your ERP system, though, as well, if your ERP systems are designed correctly. 
if your ERP systems are designed correctly and they communicate correctly and they have the information that is fed into them correctly. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, I run our company speaker program, so I'm, I'm a supporter of, of the program, but um, you do find, you know, you do, you, um, you, you want to make sure you're negotiating and, and going after those uh, opportunities. A absolutely. To costs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why one of the things that uh, the suppliers are, in fact, very cognizant and sometimes they resist taking the car because it creates the visibility of the transaction. Uh, and, uh, and that visibility can... Uh, can increase the business or hurt the business. So some of the newer incarnation of this technology, electronic accounts payable, uh, is uh, creating a lot of, lot of fuel in the market because suppliers are now, companies are moving these transactions up beyond $10,000, mm -hmm. and suppliers are, <coughs> suppliers are basically saying that uh, that is putting a much greater cost burden on us. Yes, sir. The research uh, take into account how the limits were set by the different companies, knowing that you know if uh, um, a limit was set. Remember what we talked about earlier a little bit. If a limit was set um, at a certain level, um, a certain employee may not feel as empowered, believing they can't do their job with a limit at that level. So we do not have the information in the survey on how the limits are set, but we do have information in the survey data what the limits are and how those limits. If I could just run the simple analysis based on the distribution of limits, in fact, two factors, delegation of right, that is giving the cards, and spending limit, reserving those rights. Those two factors together have a multiplier impact on, uh, on capture of the transaction. Yes, sir. On the performance, uh, how much of the, the, on the reward side, I mean, on the reward side, how much of the reward we're able to measure is due to how much, let's say, cost savings the P card improved on? So the more savings <coughs> that person got a piece of the action, if you will, so they get a, they get a reward, versus the rewards they get aren't tied directly to the actual performance of the P card and how much it saves the company. Because to me, that could be, a misalignment. Well, there, there could be a potential misalignment that uh, the administrator does not have the full control mm -hmm. on the saving. One of the saving is greater efficiency in the process. Mm -hmm. So you put a system in place, and Mahindra, who has been in charge of uh, managing the purchase and procurement paperwork, mm -hmm. is all, all of a sudden does not have to put in the same amount of work. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do not fire Mahindra or reassign Mahindra, that that saving is supposed to come to organization but not come into organization. Mm -hmm. And so, so we do not have that part. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to cut it off right here. Dean Taylor? Thank, thank you, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> well, the Business Research Series is about the, uh, the practical application of, um, of first class research, of, of cutting edge research to business applications. I think that was a really good example of uh, rigorous research. And empirical research, which, uh, which is uh, something that Odin is, uh, is as traditional. Right? So it's very much data driven, very much analytical, but with a strong critical and practical data. So thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. at the desk. Uh, please speak to any of our corporate relations people if you'd like to think about how we can be involved or help you in your business. Uh, and we can also send you emails of, uh, of the of the, um, of the of the paper if that's what we're feeling with. So. Well, Hector, I presume you would welcome new data from anybody in the room that would uh, add to your study. Absolutely. So thank you for uh, thank you for mentioning. Uh, I would I would appreciate and welcome the data not only within the PCAR context, but otherwise. But also, if you are a user of this technology, I would uh, welcome the opportunity to learn more about how your organization looks at these three legs of the organization's future. Is there, can I just ask one last question? Is, is there any thought? Uh, can we just talk? Let people. No, this is, I think other people would be interested in. Okay. Is there any thought of how to extrapolate this? Meaning, to me, the excitement was, okay, you've proven it, and that is, that is, but 
What about how to apply? My former company, I worked in 10,000 employees, and I used to say 9,000 were experts in this area. They knew how to set up performance and incentive. So what you struck on is great data, but I think the challenge in business then is how we take that and apply it in different situations. Yes, so I'm going to, okay, I'm going to step in here. Can you take that offline? Because I didn't promise we'd finish at 9am Absolutely, 9 shop. I just made something that I would be okay. interested in. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.